I have been with USCPA for a little over five years, and from the day I walked in, um, I was invested in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. When I showed up, I was told, go negotiate this agreement. And it's just been full speed ahead ever since then. Um, I want to just make sure that everyone understands that I, in the next week or two, um, will no longer be um, the director of the Great Lakes National Program Office, and I will no longer be focusing on the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, um, which prompts me to say a couple of things. First, I want to thank my team at Glenpo for the unbelievable work that you've done since I've been there on this water quality agreement. I just want to thank you very much. Uh, second, I, I want to thank the Canadian team, um, our Canadian colleagues. One of the most enjoyable things about this job has been working in an international context. And to Mike and, and Carla and everyone on the Canadian team, I can just say thank you. You have been wonderful to work with um, and I appreciate it so much. Um, finally, as I said a couple times during my talk, nothing gets done without the work of everybody. So I'd like to thank all of you um, for all the work that you've done um, and, that w and that you will continue to do. And lastly, I want to go out on a really good note and say that while I will be doing other things, my replacement is Tinka Hyde, who many of you know. So. I close by saying that the Great Lakes National Program Office and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement will be in most excellent hands, both in the US um, and on the other side of the border. So thank you very much. Okay, very good. Well, why don't we go ahead and invite uh, the other panelists up as well. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to get into our Q&A period, just as we did before, but to help us through moderating that question and answer session is Catherine Buckner. Catherine is an experienced environmental professional. She's an environmental lawyer by training with expertise in navigating complex regulatory environments and helping companies understand and manage environmental risks and opportunities. As president of the council, Catherine is developing strategies for engaging industry in Great Lakes policy and in pursuing regional sustainable development. Catherine has kindly agreed to moderate this question and answer session, but I'll uh, just remind you this time, like I did last time, that just as you've heard priorities for science and action through the Annex presentations, we want you to note that binational priority priorities for science and action for the 2017 to 2019 period uh, is online at binational.net. You don't just have to hear what uh, is said today and then comment immediately. You have until uh, November 18th. We, sh we would appreciate hearing from you by that time using our email addresses that are both in uh, the agenda and that are sometimes on the screen. Um, and then uh, just one or two other quick reminders, archived footage from the forum. Um, as I've said before, DPTV and TVO. And for those of you uh, watching remotely, please use uh, the emails as well. With that, let me invite Catherine Buckner up to the stage and open up our Q&A uh, session for the previous two panels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a note, as, as Cam said, I am the president of the Council of Great Lakes Industries, and I'm here today at the forum with Dale Fennessy, who is our longtime technical and projects director, and together we just wanted to thank Environment and Climate Change Canada and the U.S. EPA for inviting us to moderate this Q&A session, especially since it's pretty easy. So as Cam said, this Q&A session is committed to the topics that we heard this afternoon. So that would be harmful chemicals, uh, groundwater science, and like-wide action and management. And I can see that the organizers have added a couple microphones. I don't see anybody here yet, but I would invite people who have a question, come to the microphone. And if you could just mention who you are, and if you have an organizational affiliation, uh, that would be great. So that we can, uh, if there's follow-up required, um, these folks can get in touch with you afterwards. And is there a mechanism for online questions? Will you let us know if there are some? Okay, great, thank you. So come to the microphones, there's one way down at the end, one here, one here, and then one way down at that end, so. Yes, ma'am. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gail Wood, and I work for a Conservation Authority 
in, uh, in Ontario, Canada that discharges into Georgian Bay Lake, Lake Huron. I wanted to thank all the speakers. Um, really very informative day today. But I specifically would like to ask either John or Chris a question about the lake-wide management uh, action plans, which I applaud you in doing. I think they're absolutely wonderful. Um, in Ontario, we have uh, conservation authorities that work with a multitude of partners uh, to actually do on-the-ground work, whether it's stewardship, remediation, monitoring, reporting, to deliver on a lot of things that the, we're trying to achieve in the, in the Great Lakes Water Quality uh, Agreement. There's a lot of folks on the ground doing work, but we're not communicating with one another what our successes are. And I was wondering, Chris or John, if you had any comments on how through the LAMPs that are approved, we can connect better with the agencies that are doing work on the ground so that we can report and monitor our successes to make sure that we're meeting the targets that have been set out. Sure, thanks. Uh Thanks, Gail, for that question. I think we're doing that to, to some degree, but I agree with you that, that much more needs to be done. You know, the, the strategy for LAMPS is to create a binational framework, a binational plan within which domestic implementation occurs. So, for example, in your watershed, in the Lake Huron watershed, you're probably aware the Lake Huron Centre for Coastal Conservation is involved along with lots of other local uh, agencies, watershed management agencies, provincial government agencies, uh, doing a lot of domestic work that we think fits very well under the umbrella of the Lake Huron Binational Partnership and on the Canadian side, the uh, Canadian Framework for Action. Uh, so I, I do think there's opportunities. We do have LAMP annual reports where we try to report on, on, on some of the uh, successes of those agencies, but a good point to try to do more in future. Okay, people, please feel free to come to the microphones. Don't make a liar out of me. I said this was easy, so uh, make it easy for me. Okay, we have a question, because otherwise I have a bunch of questions up here, but they're boring, so. Next question, please. <laughs> and, and, and excuse me for saying this, but I think we are, I'm seeing some, I can't hear you in the back um, of the panelists, I think, so if we could make sure we all speak into the microphone, that'd be great. So I'm Christine Drimmy from Durham Region. Um, when you were speaking about the lamps and the near shore framework, I heard uh, a, a phrase that has become very familiar to us at the municipal level, which is, you'll, we'll invite you to the table. Thank you very much. We're glad to be invited. Um, we seem to be at an awful lot of tables lately, though, and um, we we're already doing a lot of work at the municipal level to try and protect water systems, uh, either through water pollution control plants, improving them, and by um, it, it, stormwater management and low impact development guidelines and all of these sorts of things. We're pretty well heavily invested already in this kind of work. So I think when I read the Near Shore Framework or even the Lake Superior Plan, which I had a quick look at, what I see is a lot of identification of priorities and um, plans for action and science, but what I fail to see is um, the commitments at um, the federal and provincial level both, with things like at the provincial level, the Great Lakes Protection Act, where, again, we've been invited to the table. They're inviting us to bring forward initiatives to help protect watersheds and the lakes. But where the resources are going to come from is, is the question. And I don't know if um, others in the room have ideas about where those resources come from. I'm not sure how it works in the American side. I know that there's um, some private sector um, foundations and that sort of thing that contribute to these kinds of projects. But um, when you invite us to the table, please don't ask us to bring the food and cook it and then meet your, your uh, high uh, critical uh, culinary standards at the same time because we have, the, the cupboard's lo looking a little bare. Great so analogy. I think that's for Chris and John. No, a very, uh, very good comment and I, I certainly appreciate uh, where you're coming from there. Um, you know, part of our role is to, again, create this uh, binational agreement within which uh, the local work can be undertaken. And it is all collaborative. 
Uh, none of us individually are, are doing uh, one project without collaborators. And sometimes those collaborations uh, form when, you know, stars align and there's opportunities that present themselves. What we're trying to do with the Nearshore Framework is build, bring a little rigor to the setting of priority areas for restoration and protection. So rather than just, uh, you know, work in collaborations where opportunities present themselves, let's make sure we're working on the most important areas across the Great Lakes. I know for each municipality, your piece of shoreline is the most important area for you. Uh, we're, we're looking at the Great Lakes from a different scale. This gentleman way down at the end. Uh, my name is uh, Aman Jot Singh and I'm senior engineer at the Credit Valley Conservation Authority. And my question is for groundwater folks. Um, my focus is on uh, green infrastructure, like low impact development, as well as uh, 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 Lake Ontario water quality. Um, you guys brought uh, an interesting um, concern, which you know, which is around green infrastructure and water quality, especially with the uh, with the with the chlorides getting uh, infiltrated along with infiltrated water. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, are there any guidelines that are coming uh, a, in, in the reports or any regulatory um, you know, guidelines? Uh, because even if you look where no green infrastructure was implemented, I'm talking about uh, some areas in Cooksville Creek, uh, in Mississauga, and uh, other catchment areas, we see chloride levels exceeding 25,000 during winter and spring, which is quite close to what are there uh, in, um, in the ocean. And even during ambient conditions, like I'm talking about late, late summer and early, early fall, the levels are around 1,000 milligrams per liter. So that problem, the chloride problem already exists. And if I'm talking about late summer and uh, early fall, that's all coming through the base flow, which is coming from uh, uh, the groundwater. And it's not of concern in that area because that area uses groundwater, uh, not uses groundwater, but it uses uh, lake water for, for drinking purpose. So that problem is there. And as we'll be developing uh, the, the areas which are highly dependent upon groundwater, even if we don't implement green infrastructure, still they will face the similar issue. So I'm just curious, what are the guidelines? I don't want, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, just the concerns restricting us to implement green infrastructure, but develop some kind of guidelines for those who are willing to, you know, embrace green infrastructure in their gray infrastructure, have some guidelines so that these things can be implemented in betterhood of, you know, the entire water cycle and also Great Lakes. Thanks. Well, and yes, um, so in our report, we do address the whole area of urban development, um, the impacts of urban development on groundwater, and talk about um, more broadly the, some of those issues, and try to bring together a, um, a, a good comprehensive picture of, of uh, the issues. Uh, I don't recall that our, that, that specific chapter uh, brings in much discussion of guidelines per se, but more about the issues, uh, the, the knowledge about those, um, I guess you could say the shared experience um, because of uh, the different studies that have been done. Um, so it's, it's bringing together that knowledge in that way. That's what that report focuses on. Maybe Norm, you want to comment further? No, I think, I think that's absolutely right. Um, it is, I, I think I would just say, uh, it's something to keep your eye on. Uh, uh, 25,000 milligrams per liter is pretty high concentration. Uh, I had not heard that, that high a concentration before. So uh, again, that, that just points out uh, why we need to think about this more. But to my knowledge, there are no uh, guidelines on that yet. And I don't believe, um, what, I would assume it's up to the regulatory agencies to actually do the guidelines. I don't think the water quality agreement should get in the guideline business necessarily, other than in a very general way, right? Yeah. 
and that was the reason I just wanted uh, some attention on this thing because chlorides are problem anyway. So it's not only uh, you know so not hammer on the good initiative which are going towards for green infrastructure, but develop something which can help uh, you know uh, the agencies to uh, to better you know regulate uh, the salt spreading. Thanks. Right. Yeah, you really do bring up a good point. We are certainly not saying green infrastructure is bad by any means. In fact, we are very, very much promoting green infrastructure. In fact, I believe uh, EPA just cr just created a national report about the the benefits of infiltrating water in, uh, but it was focused on areas where uh, where there are water shortages, and this is another way to get more water back in the groundwater system. That's a little different um, message maybe in Tucson, Arizona than it is in Detroit, Michigan, for example, right? Catherine, may I just make a comment on the green infrastructure? Over here. Oh, uh, Michelle <laughs> Sells with Michigan's <laughs> Office of the Great Lakes. And uh, actually, the state of Michigan and our partners in uh, the eight Great Lakes states and uh, Ontario and Quebec are going to be hosting a green infrastructure conference May 30th through June 2nd in 2017. And we'll be covering a lot of, of these kinds of questions, topics at the conference. So that'll be hosted in Detroit at Cobo Hall and there are flyers uh, in the exhibit area. And Ed. Um, I just want to say in a sense of fairness, I think we do need to get some questions together for our important Annex 3 Chemicals of Mutual Concern <laughs> people. So, yes ma'am. I'm Karen Buck and I'm a water advocate and a resident of the city of Toronto. And what really piqued my interest was the addition of radionuclides to the Chemicals of Mutual Concern. And I'm just wondering why and then what radionuclides, and where are they coming from? So, uh, I'll start. let me clarify that it has been nominated, is this on, is this good? It's been nominated for the next round of evaluations for chemicals of mutual concern. Um, so at this point, we're really at the very initial stages of looking at the nomination. There's lots more to come. Right. And there was no background as to why it was being nominated to give us an idea of what, what sort of is the concern? So, no. I, I, no, I don't know if it was. Yeah, the radionuclides were nominated through an external uh, nomination process. So a number of groups in the Great Lakes uh, mm -hmm. Basin got together and provided uh, quite a healthy document with lots of background information about the nuclear fuel cycle and their concerns associated with that. Um, so there is quite a bit of information that was submitted along with the nomination. Right. Okay, thank you. Just can, I, well, um, can I just add to that? Yeah. Um, and, and to find that information, you can look at the Canadian Environmental Law Association's uh, website and look up radionuclides nomination. And that's where the background document it was behind the explanation, which over, over 120 groups have signed on to that nomination, as well as, as some others like the Cities Initiative, et cetera. Margaret, did you have something to add to that? No, uh, something that doesn't have to do with radionuclides. So the, the reason these kinds of meetings are good, for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons uh, is that when I said that there was only one external nomination, um, during my talk, someone pointed out that they had submitted a nomination, and it turns out it got lost in the mail, so there is a second external nomination um, for sulfate. So I just wanted to take that opportunity to let okay. people know that. Uh, I don't know who was first, but let's start at this gentleman. With this. Thank you. My name is Charles Hazel. I'm with SOS Great Lakes. Um, the uh, subject of radionuclides in the water is uh, welcomed as a consideration. Uh, one of my questions, and I have two, uh, has to do with the, um, uh, the upcoming uh, deliberations by the Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change in Ottawa and over the application for a deep geological repository for intermediate and uh, low-level waste and uh, adjacent and related to that is the high-level waste site on Lake Huron, shores of Lake Huron, and the high-level waste not far from it. Uh, those are matters of extreme concern, 
uh, with regards to the water table, uh, water quality, and uh, of course radionuclides and the transmission of those through groundwater and to the water we drink and uh, we use for other purposes. The minister is going to be considering the application uh, over the next uh, little while, has been and will continue to, as the, uh, the panel or as your uh, organization uh, reviews the, uh, this important subject uh, which has been raised uh, 20 years ago and was put on the shelf for lack of direct knowledge. How will you uh, take the information that you have now, uh, develop recommendations and um, uh, do it in time to provide informed uh, knowledge to the minister at this very important time in decision making for Canada and the United States? That's question one. So as you point out, uh, you know, there was a joint review panel environmental assessment report and our minister last February requested additional information from Ontario Power Generation to support the environmental assessment. Uh, Ontario Power Generation is to submit that information by the end of December 2016. Yeah, my, I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, I wasn't clear enough. Um, how does your work relate to uh, the Minister's decision uh, as it has, uh, 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 as it is about decision making on, at a bilateral level, which you would expect uh, to be taken into consideration uh, at this point where we will decide whether to build it or not? Right, so on both sides of the border, there is a notification process in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Both Canada and the U.S. make sure that the other side knows about significant developments that are going on that may impact uh, the waters. Uh, so certainly the U.S. was informed of uh, this and made representation at the hearings. Um, as far as the decision, it's a decision for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada. And as you probably know, the uh, regulatory agency responsible for it is the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. So, uh, the, you know, as far as lake-wide management goes, I mean, we do try to keep track of uh, various kinds of developments in the lakes as they might affect uh, lake water quality. Um, this has not been a, a significant discussion, I wouldn't say, within the Lake Huron Binational Partnership because it really is on a separate track as far as decision-making goes. But it all affects water quality, doesn't it? It's what we drink. And it was raised as an issue of great concern by the Lieutenant Governor in the opening remarks. So has, is it not going to be raised uh, or developed in time to inform the Minister, perhaps? And that yeah, is your position. Yeah, I would just say it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I work for the Minister, so uh, my department will be providing advice to the minister and she'll be making the decision. Excellent, thank yeah. you. And the other question has to do with groundwater and uh, the relationship of that uh, to, the, um, to the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, as you discuss it in more detail, as it so richly deserves, uh, will you be considering the expansion of the, uh, in a sense, the area of concern to uh, include not only the uh, Great Lakes Basin as it's recognized on the surface, but also as it, that extends uh, into groundwater systems well beyond the uh, perimeter of the Great Lakes Basin as it's defined for your purposes to date. Yeah. Uh, I think that probably affects the U.S. side more than the Canadian side and, and specifically um, in the uh, Milwaukee part of Chicago area, right, where the where the surface water divide and the groundwater divides are not coincident, um, and where they have been altered by groundwater withdrawals. Exactly. Um, including, um, I thought it was interesting that uh, radionuclides came up. Uh, one of the issues related to deep groundwater withdrawal in that area are, is uh, increased radionuclide concentrations in those wells. Um, now, that's naturally occurring, and as it, it's occurring because the water level has been drawn down to the point where it exposes um, s geologic materials that previously were covered with water, exposes them to oxygen. By oxygenating them, it allows them to get incorporated into the water. So it's a kind of a complex thing that's, that is naturally occurring but related to 
the way the water is managed, basically. So, um, so that's an issue that I thought maybe you were asking early on, and it's a good, good question and a good issue. We don't currently have plans to think about uh, beyond the surface water boundary. And the reason for that is, at this point in time, at least, we're concentrating on shallow groundwater. And those withdrawals that, um, that occur deep in the system are, have not been part of our analysis. That doesn't mean that at some point in the more distant future we might consider that, but as of now we're thinking of the shallow groundwater system and in particular the interaction between that shallow groundwater system and the Great Lakes themselves. So to expect that uh, the deep groundwater system in the Wisconsin area is direct, directly connected to the lakes is, uh, there is a tiny connection, but a relatively insignificant one. Um, and it really is the shallow groundwater that interacts with the waters of the Great Lakes much more than that deep groundwater system. And indeed, I'm sorry, that's the relationship between the DGR uh, deep no, no, no. Levels. That's the relationship between the deep uh, wells in the Wisconsin, Illinois area. Yes. Right. Okay. And it's and what they have done instead of you know some people talk about how that is actually withdrawing water from the Great Lakes into their wells. It's that d hasn't really occurred. What has occurred is that water that would have been in the Great Lakes basin has now gone into the, those wells. Yes. But it hasn't actually sucked water out of the Great Lakes into those wells. Do you see it as a major issue in the future? Well, probably not. You know, they're really backing off on the amount of water that's being withdrawn out of those wells. And really, the water levels are rising. Uh, this is, I probably shouldn't monopolize the conversation here, but it is an amazing story that when wells were first drilled north of Chicago in the 18, late 1800s, the water flowed 100 feet above land surface. And then there was so much water taken out of the groundwater system that by the, what, 70s, 60s, 70s, somewhere in there, the water was 600 feet below land surface. So the water had, was drawn down hugely. But Think about that in relation to the Great Lakes. And these wells are not far from the Great Lakes, right? So if there had been a good connection between the Great Lakes and those wells, those wells would never have been drawn down 700 feet. You know, that water from the lakes would have moved in to, to occupy that void, right? And they didn't simply because there wasn't that good connection. So that's why, in general, we're not as interested in that deep groundwater system as we are the shallow groundwater system. Norm, is this detail in the report that you and No, no, okay. we really don't right. have any of this. In the I was going to refer the gentleman to the report, but I can't. But there are reports that do detail that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry to keep you waiting for so long. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gerald Parker. I'm from the Institute of Canadian Justice, and I was asked to uh, reapproach this this afternoon. Is this working? Okay. Um, thank you, all of you, for starters. Uh, I do believe this is a watershed moment in Canada's history. That night in Kingston, it changed us all. Um, groundwater is politically charged. It's our next step, a major one, but we need to take it. As Norm said, groundwater is our savings account. It's being robbed right now as we speak by corporate entities that are depleting and outbidding our municipalities for their groundwater. And as was spoken to in part, but not answered directly, we've got less water as a result. Our streams are less, our rivers run lower, we got more concentrations of pollutants as a result, and yes, those groundwater aquifers take longer to recover. So what are we going to do to stop this robbery? What are we going to do to ensure that the private profiteers who are outbidding our local municipalities for our water, spending less than $4 for a million liters, what are we going to do to make that change? What can we do? Because it's only going to get a lot worse under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, big time. So how can we stop this ecological robbery? 
now and for the future. It's spiritualism or materialism. It's a choice that needs to be made. I think our Canadian government's more of a spiritual than a material nature. I'd like to see them put their money where their mouth is for real. In, my, in return to my colleague from the Durham region where I live, go Whitby. We want to do good things, but we need federal and provincial money to make it happen. It's a ridiculous situation that our uh, sewage plant is sitting on the prime lakefront of our town as it is in most. We got to do better. So what can we do to create the science and quantify and qualify to stop this robbery from taking place? To enable our decision makers to help us, to aid us, and not to abet others who have got our interests well against our interests. What can we do? What regulations, what policies, what actions can we take to save our groundwater? We got 20% of the world's groundwater here in Canada. We've got stewardship, we've got obligations, we've got morality. I think we can do something. It's the next step, it's politically charged, but let's not avoid it. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone? Are you gonna... Well, let me, let me start by saying uh, this is really, uh, the specific issue is a Canadian issue, but it is, uh, it does, it does cross, it does cross the, the boundary because uh, in Michigan there was a similar issue. Uh, where, uh, where water withdrawals uh, were heavily scrutinized in a similar way. Now, uh, a lot of that will depend, or in, in Michigan, um, I think we have reached a, uh, an, a, an agreement, maybe, I'm sure not everyone agrees with it, but I believe that, uh, that, that uh, those withdrawals are, are not being unsustainably taken. No, I, I don't know whether that's, that, that would be the goal at any rate, and I think uh, there hasn't been much uproar about them lately. Uh, so there are, th that's one thing. I think it can be sustainably managed and, and uh, still, still uh, be successful. Um, so anyway, so it, it is a cross-border issue. Whether or not, we, and we have not dealt with that specific issue as part of our groundwater work for the annex. However, um, um, I don't know what, what to do on the management side. Yeah, I, I can't comment on the local, uh, I guess, issues that you've, you've alluded to. Um, but what I can say is that our annex, uh, the subcommittee was set up by 2013, and, and since that time, we spent a lot of time and, and put together a, a very detailed report. So basically, really working hard at summarizing the state of the science. Um, and that's where we've put the focus of our work. That's where the bulk of our time was spent up till now. Um, that report is, is going to be very useful going forward. Um, it's only now, I think, that we as, uh, as a, a subcommittee, as an annex, will now start looking more at some of the management issues and trying to share some of the information, some of the knowledge, trying to, I think, hopefully be a, a, a place where we, information can be shared about success stories, about things that work, about different experiences, and about uh, how the science fits in. And I think that's the role that we'll play. Right. And for the most part, the annex does not deal with quantity. It deals with quality. But it's really hard at some point to completely separate them. That is, I mean, the example I gave in, uh, um, in uh, Wisconsin, for example, um, that's a quantity issue but has created some quality issues. So they're, they're not totally inseparable. Um, but as a result, we would focus more on the quantity issue than the quality issue uh, in, in our annex work. Because we are not looking at drinking water, we're looking at waters, uh, uh, groundwater as it affects the quality of the water of the Great Lakes. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Barakat Nagasi. I'm uh, a graduate student at the University of Waterloo. Uh, my question is, um, as the Great Lakes system is a very complex one, uh, are there initiatives uh, towards uh, learning and communicating with other uh, similar experiences in other parts of the world, uh, such as uh, the Rhine River system in Europe and other 
experiences so as to learn the best of uh, how others have dealt with specific uh, issues uh, relating to policy, institutional uh, structures. So yes, I, I can tell you that in the, in the U.S. in uh, Region 5, we have met with representatives from China, Peru, uh, Bolivia, India, um, other countries who have come in and said, y you and Canada try to manage this enormous ecosystem of some 300,000 square miles. Um, how do you do it? And we just basically sat down with them uh, and shared presentations and shared coffee and we've described to them, for example, in great detail, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and how it apportions work and how it reflects a binational approach to the lake. So the short answer is yes, with, with a number of countries um, we've done that. And in fact, I think the state of Michigan recently hosted some people from Israel to talk about um, water issues and complex ecosystems and how um, how those should be managed and I think uh, one of my staffers participated in that. So certainly we've done a number of those. It, it hasn't been comprehensive. It's generally done when a when a, a delegation says we'd like to come in and talk to you about it. But but sure, we we've done a number of those. I saw a thumbs up from Michigan's Office of the Great Lakes back there on the meeting with Israel. Um, I'm not sure we have any other questions, but I have a quick question. The power I have of the one podium. Question, Catherine. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. If it's okay. Of course. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lana Pollock. I'm with the International Joint Commission, and I think I can anticipate from just the conversation in this room that the um, uh, the naming of a, a chemical of mutual concern is going to occupy some more thought and discussion and out conversation with the public in, in the next few months as the IJC goes out and listens uh, to the public. It would be helpful, I think, today if, if you would explain the process, since we're in Canada, not process, of, <laughs> of, of a chemical being nominated and then getting on. Because you, in, in, pace, in your explanation, if you would, special attention, what does it mean? external and internal and on the internal is everybody on the internal team or committee uh, government or are there external interests on the internal it, just so that everybody starts with an understanding of the process and I'll, as, as I'm standing here um, I want to thank Chris uh, just as you go um, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, a lot has been accomplished so thank you should you. much to be proud of and as, as we say, <laughs> as they say on Diane Ream, I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'll take a shot at this. The um, external nominations process was developed after the first round of CMCs were um, nominated and reviewed and proposed. So the first round, the eight chemicals and chemical groups that you saw on the, the screen that we showed were not um, open to external nominations. So that was the difference that I was trying to explain between external and internal. Um, so when we did the second round of nominations, we took nominations both from internal like we did the first go around, but also we opened it up to the external process. So that's the nomination process. In the first round, uh, we um, developed teams. We called them ITTs. I forgot what the I stands for, but identification. it's identification. <laughs> Thank you, task teams, um, where we had a group of government and non-government um, members review the data and at, sometimes gather more data and develop um, binational reports, which are on binational.net. Um, that were drafted to go through that criteria that I mentioned about whether or not the chemical is a risk in the Great Lakes. Um, is it currently a risk? Are there management structures in place that are going to address it, or are there still additional actions needed? So there's the binational con considerations um, for that chemical. And, and so once all of that information is was um, sorted through and digested by the committee, the um, ITT, 
then there was recommendations made to the government committee on which chemicals should be nominated. Actually, I was going to ask something somewhat similar, believe it or not. I was going to invite each of these presenter teams to sort of give a few sentences on where the public engagement opportunities are. But we have another question, so let's go there first. Um, yes, I'm uh, Dr. Ellen Daly from Erie, Pennsylvania, and a, can you hear me? No. I um, director of uh, yeah. SOS. Um, and this is a um, historical radionuclide question for the IJC. Um, in the 1990s, the IJC appointed a nuclear task force to study radionuclides in the Great Lakes because of the concern of the large number of nuclear facilities ringing the Great Lakes. Um, the task force then prepared two reports for them. One was an inventory of the radionuclides, and the second was a report on the bioaccumulation of elements to accompany the inventory. Those reports concluded there was insufficient data to determine the behavior of radioactive elements in freshwater food chains, and also recommended that additional studies were needed to assess the bioaccumulation and biomagnification of radionuclides in a freshwater ecosystem. So my question is, were those studies ever done? That's the first part, and if not, why not, and then, since the IJC recognized that these were potentially toxic chemicals back in the 1990s, why did the governments not include these in the list of the first um, chemicals of mutual concern? Yeah, I, I can't answer the first part of the question. I don't. I don't know uh, to what degree IJC, those recommendations were implemented by the, the parties during those years. Is there a way we could put that in the bike rack and get back Let's park that the one. information? Yeah, so you had a two-part question. One was uh, well, really, related to the I IJC. Guess. The second one was the government's response to the IJC recommendation in the 90s. Yes. Can we park it? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any questions from online? Okay, one more. If so there's time. Catherine. Yeah. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Go ahead, Mark. You had asked about public I I did. Input. If you could, yeah. Yeah, so um, if you remember on one of the slides that I went through very quickly, um, we are still working on um, trying to design the best way to get public input at, different, at various phases. But we do have a number of points where we um, look to stakeholders, partners, and the public for input. One of them is meetings like this. The biannual GLEC meetings are another opportunity. We always do a report out on status for Annex 3 for all the annexes. Um, and we also ha put our draft products up on binational.net, and um, I think we are looking for input on other ways that we can also um, engage the public. Great, great invitation. And Chris and John, I think your opportunities for public engagement were pretty clear in your presentation. Did you, uh, Dale and Norm, did you want to add anything on public engagement in the groundwater science annex? Yeah, we uh, we do not have anything planned at the moment, and here's the reason. Uh, we did get some good public engagement. In fact, uh, the Council of Great Lakes Industries gave us lots of good advice on the uh, report that we did. And Gail Kranzberg and her group also, I don't know if you're still here, Gail, gave us some excellent advice or excellent suggestions for that. So, and I can't remember how many, but we got a number of uh, suggestions about that report. So we, we collected that and included what we could into the report and, and uh, that kind of got us to that phase. Uh, we have, so, and we kind of feel that that report at this point is put to bed not that it has all the answers or not that it's perfect, don't get me wrong, <laughs> it's definitely not, but, um, but uh, we don't necessarily think we need engagement there. But we are entering the next phase of the Annex uh, 8 work, and that phase focuses on groundwater management. And uh, we believe that we will probably see a transition of members of the subcommittee that are more engaged in, in the management side rather than the science side. And as they come on board, 
that we will look for our opportunities and probably guided by the new members of the Annex subcommittee. Okay, great. Binational.net is, okay? is a great source of information, and I'm sorry, I sucked up some time. Go ahead. No problem. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm from the University of Toronto, a master's student in the Exercise Sciences Department. My question is to John and Chris about the Lake uh, LAMP, Lakewide Ma Action Management Plans. Uh, is there anything in the plan um, describing initiatives or regarding initiatives about water privatization in and around the Great Lakes, kind of building off the previous gentleman's comment, but specifically in the lamps? Uh, I'm sorry, about water what? Privatization. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Uh, for the Lake Superior Lamp, no, there's nothing in there about that. Again, our focus is, is primarily on water quality and uh, the, the state of the ecosystem as it affects water quality. Okay, thank you. All set. All right, thank you so much for your uh, questions and discussion during this session.